10, verses 1 through 6. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth by some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Father, we thank for this word, for we know that Christ is the word. Give us eyes to see Christ as our shepherd, and open our ears that we may hear when he calls. Father, be with Kim as he preaches Christ today. Amen. Well, if you'll keep your place here in John chapter 10, this is going to be the text from which I'm speaking today, entitled The Shepherd and the Sheepfold. I've heard it said that when you preach, you just take the gospel and make it as simple as possible so that even a child could understand. But here we have something that's very simply set forth. You've got a shepherd, you've got a sheep, and you've got a sheep fold. And yet, in verse 6, it says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. That tells us right there. You can make this message as simple as we find it here in Scripture. But unless the Lord gives eyes to see, and unless the Lord gives ears to hear, you'll have no understanding. Maybe you'll come away thinking, oh, that was a cute illustration. But it's not about cuteness, nor is it simply about learning about shepherds and sheep and sheepfolds. But there's a message here concerning Christ that only the Spirit of God can give us ears to hear and thereby draw our hearts to Him. That's always my prayer when I preach, not just to inform and not just to have you be able to go away and cite certain things about the message, but what of Christ? Who is He? How is it that this is the one here in John chapter 10 as we read on through it calls himself the good shepherd and when we just finished reading there in Ezekiel 34 see that God had promised to raise up a shepherd here he was in fulfillment of all that the Old Testament scriptures foretold of him and yet people didn't see him I hear people say live as if People can see Christ in you. They didn't even see Christ in Christ. It's going to take him opening the ears and the eyes, just like he did the blind man. So when we come in here into John chapter 10, it's very important for us to understand the connection between chapter 10 and what we just saw in the healing of the blind man. Because in the last chapter, there were those Pharisees that had physical eyes to see. People say, well, if Christ could just come back today and walk on our streets, people would believe. They didn't believe him in his day. Here were the Pharisees had physical eyes to see, but they did not see Christ. And here was a blind man that he healed that was given not just physical eyes to see, but spiritual eyes to see. To where when Christ came unto him, like we saw last time, and found him, think about all the others in that city that there were but here was Christ seeking out this one what was he doing seeking one of his sheep so now you're seeing the connection between chapter 10 and chapter 9 when he says here verily verily I say unto you he's still talking here to that same group of Pharisees which back in verse 41 said unto them and here he says I say unto you if ye were blind, he said in verse 41, you would have no sin. What's he saying there? What he's saying is, if we would see ourselves as blind, needy sinners, then we would have no sin 
because it's for such sinners that the Lord Jesus Christ came in the world to save. He came to seek and save that which is lost. That's why he's saying you'd have no sin because Christ would be their ransom. But now ye say, and oh how many there are in religious profession that say, we see. It's like one person said when the preacher asked her, how long have you been a Christian? She said, oh, I've been a Christian all my life. And he told her, he said, well, that's too long because you've never been made to see a time when you were blind, lost, and now the Lord has made you to see. That's what he's saying here. Because you say we see, notice, therefore your sin remaineth. It remains because as long as a person thinks they see, as long as a person confides in any way in their own works, their own will, trusting themselves in any way, they're still blind. And that sin abides. And so this is the context here as we come now into chapter 10. Our passage begins with verily, verily. Truly, truly is what that means. I say unto you. The antecedent of the word you here, when he says you, it's in the Pharisees, as I said in the previous chapter. And the occasion here of this word comes on the heels of this beggar, this blind man being excommunicated by these very Pharisees. Even as in John 9, 34, we saw that. They answered and said, Unto him, thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. That's what people do when they're left to the blindness of their own self-righteousness. Or so many that think they don't even need to hear a message like this. Go preach that somewhere else. Don't preach that to us. Well, to them this word is addressed. You say you see but because you say you see, then you are blind. And the mention here of the sheepfold, when it says here in verse 10, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. In this particular context, the sheepfold has to do with the sheepfold of the Jews of which these Pharisees pretended to have the guardianship. It was all about them. So their anger was even over this blind man who had sat for years in that temple and the Pharisees did nothing but throw him some alms every once in a while and feel good about what they had done. They had nothing that they could ever do to deliver that man. And now comes Christ finding this one who had been under their tutelage, unable to help, but now Christ speaks the word. What's he doing? He's seeking out one of his own and bringing him out of that sheepfold. This one was the Lord's all along. He just didn't know it. He found out about it. It's like any of us. We're raised in a sheepfold of religion. And we've had many preachers over us that would be compared to these that Christ calls the thieves and the robbers. And how long we sat under that form of leadership or preaching and didn't know any other way until it pleased God to cause the word of Christ to be heard and brought home to our hearts just like this blind man and our eyes made to see and suddenly now being drawn out it created a jealousy any of us that have been through this experience as the Lord has taught us and brought us out of those denominations or congregations where the preacher has held his thumb down on everybody for them to see one of their own renounce them and go and follow after Christ, it stirs up the same sort of anger that we see here mentioned by these Pharisees. The reference here in verse 1, the thieves, 
and robbers climbing up some other way. What Christ was doing was denouncing the Pharisees as false shepherds, those false shepherds of which we read there in Ezekiel chapter 34. And so he's rebuking them even here. When it says here in verse 6 that they did not understand the things which he spoke unto them, as we read on, they really did understand. They just didn't want to understand because they preferred their own honor to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here the Lord is rebuking them. When you talk about someone climbing up some other way, being a thief and a robber, he's talking about their unlawful conduct. Here were men that boasted in being keepers of the law, and yet that very law condemned them for how it was they were leading the sheep. So in the course of this parable, that's what it's called here in verse 6, or it could be a proverb. You say, well, why did the Lord speak in parables in Proverbs? Well, as he said elsewhere, that those that are without might not hear and understand, but those for whom God has purposed them to understand that they might hear. So if we're one of his sheep, when we hear that word parable, our ears perk up. Because here's a lesson that God has purposed just for his sheep. Just for his own, not for everybody else. That's how a lot of people read the Bible. They think this is for everybody. And everybody grab it and get what you can out of it. That's not why this word is written. This word is addressed to a particular people concerning a particular Savior and a particular sacrifice and a particular people. And that is those that the Father has given him. But that's what this is here. So throughout the course of this parable, and it's going to take us some time to get down through John 10, these 42 verses. But here's the introduction here, where the Lord is contrasting himself with the Pharisees as being the true shepherd. Later on when he declares that, I am the good shepherd in verse 11. He's still addressing these that had gathered around and yet were blind but said they saw. And that made them all the angrier. You realize this is the reason why people get upset over this message that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ alone? You say, why are you getting upset? It's because they want a part of the glory. They think that somehow something they do or their zeal or their will or their works contributed is what in cooperation with, with what Christ has done then together we're going to pat each other on the back that's not how it is there's only one person that gets the glory and salvation and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and that's who the blind man that the Lord healed that's what he was doing giving Christ the glory and that's why they got upset at him back there in verse 34 you were altogether born in sin and, and now you teach us out of here cast him out. That was a blessing when they cast him out. Never look back when religion casts you out. That's a blessing. They're doing God's work and separating you out from that religious sheepfold as we're going to see here. But there are two main reasons why people have had difficulty, I believe, understanding this parable that we have here in John. And I've had some read and say, oh, we know what that's all about, do you? Do you realize there are actually three doors mentioned here in this parable, if you think you got it? There's a door of the sheepfold in verse 1. There's the door of the sheep in verse 7 that we'll look at next time. And then there's the door of salvation in verse 9. And we know Christ is the door. But is that the door to which he's referring to here in verse 10 when it, and verse 1 when it comes to the door of the sheepfold? Here's where we need the wisdom of the Lord to consider the circumstances under which the Lord is giving this particular parable and failure. To understand or distinguish between these three doors can cause us to miss the whole purpose of why this parable was given. You know, in a parable, 
there's one particular point which we're to look for. There's a lot of other detail that we're to consider. And I'm not a mathematician, but I still remember a parabola. I remember somehow there's a perpendicular plane and there's a point where down there it touches. And then you've got this side up, this side here. I remember you having to graph these things before. But that one particular point where it touches that, that perpendicular line, that's what we're looking for here in this particular parable as the Lord gives it. And so let's look first of all at the context. I didn't purposely do this this way, but it happened that every one of my points today starts with a C. So the first one is going to be context. And that's important. Every scripture has to be understood in its context. And here, as we saw in the previous chapter, the Lord had given sight to this blind man. And that's what aroused the jealousy of the Pharisees. And that's really why people get upset with you. Because here you are, as the Lord has taught you now, giving him all the glory, not even considering all the background and teaching that they ever gave you because they weren't pointing you to Christ. What are they? They're upset. They're jealous. Because now... Your eyes have been drawn to the shepherd. And that's really what we see here. That when the, this beggar, that's all he was. Been a beggar, a blind beggar all his life. I hope you're never embarrassed to have that as part of your testimony. What were you before you knew the Lord? I was a blind beggar. That's all I was. And that's all I am now, except for now the Lord's given me eyes to see. But I'm still a beggar of mercy. But that's the point here that we see. And they cast him out of the... Synagogue, and when Christ heard this, he saw him out. That's a beautiful picture, too. The sheep is not delivered from this religious sheepfold just to go out on his own. No, the Lord, having delivered him, sought him out and continued to reveal himself to him as the Son of God. That's a blessing. So I'm thinking about what it is to be a sheep, always under the care of this shepherd. I joke now because the older I get, I've actually got four doctors right now looking out for my health. And uh, I feel special. <laughs> Some people say, what are you doing four doctors? Well, everyone's got their specialty and everyone thinks that they can help, so they got their hand in the pie, so to speak. But that's not even to be compared to having one shepherd, Christ, caring for his sheep and not just in some general way you know he knows us better than we know ourselves he knows us in our weaknesses and yet loves each one of his own with that everlasting love that he had with the father even before he came into this world i'll tell you you talk about being special that he never leaves any one of his own there's going to be days of valleys and rough paths, these things. But the shepherd is always leading. He's not driving his sheep. He's leading. And his attention is ever on those of his own. And this is what drew forth this confession from this blind man that he healed. What was his confession? When the Lord found him, again, we're reviewing a little bit what we saw in verse 38, that order is so important. Verse 37 of chapter 9, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. When the Lord asked him that question in verse 35, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He was like, Who is he that I might believe? And he said, Thou hast both seen him, and he it is that talketh with thee. That's what it takes. Seen and what? Hearing. Where does that originate? It comes from Christ himself. All the while the Lord was seeking him, he was drawing him, and when he said, Lord, I believe, he worshipped him. To me, that's the evidence that one is a sheep. It's in responding to the shepherd's voice. This is why the Lord has convinced me that all I need to do when I preach, is to point sinners to Christ. 
declare him to sinners. And if they're one of his sheep, guess what? They're going to hear his voice. It's not an audible voice. You shouldn't be sitting there listening and thinking, well, I wonder if I'm going to hear a voice. It's through his word. That's what we're studying right now. Whether it's the youngest child or the oldest adult, how is it we're going to know that we're one of the Lord's sheep? My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. That's what Christ said. So after this, as we saw last time in chapter 9, that's when the Lord announced. This isn't for everybody. The Jesus of Scripture is not for everybody. He did not come into this world to try to save everybody. If that's the Jesus on whom you believe, it's not the Christ of Scripture. Because the Lord himself said there in verse 39, remember that in chapter 9? For judgment I'm come into this world. That what? They which see not might see. Well, who does that describe? But that's every one of God's elect as they're born in this world. They're born blind. The Lord has to give them eyes to see. And that's His judgment. We talk about a judgment. A judge gives His rendering. And that's what Christ did. He said that they which see not might see. So it's a good thing when the Lord shows us we're nothing but blind beggars and sinners. There's hope. But he also said that they which see might be made blind. Do you realize the more a person said, oh, I, I, I see, you don't need to tell them. The more they declare their blindness. And unless the Lord is pleased to do a work of grace, that's how they'll die. They'll die in that unbelief. And some of the Pharisees when they heard him with physical ears, they asked him, are we blind also? Remember that? You saw that in verse 40? Were they really asking to learn? Were they really wanting to be told, yes, you are? No. They were asking in the sense of, we're not blind. Why are you thinking we're blind? So that was that self-confidence, that self-righteousness which was their blindness. Someone said that sin has slain its thousands and self-righteousness its ten thousands. People that don't ever see their need of Christ because they don't see themselves as being needy. And therefore their sin remains. And so it's to them. Remember, this audience here in particular, we're benefiting from it listening to it, but this particular audience was an unbelieving audience for the most part, except for this one man, beggar, that the Lord had given eyes to see. Don't you imagine he was rejoicing as he stood there with Christ as his shepherd? Just picture the little sheep next to the shepherd. He, the Lord had already come and rescued him out of the jaws of these that were nothing more than wolves. And, uh, all of his hope and safety was now in Christ. So that's the context in understanding this particular parable. The second C of this message is culture. You know, when I was in Africa preaching, I would always hear this complaint. People would say, ah, oh, that's a white man's message there, and you don't need to be listening to him. And I was the minority, and I was preaching to a bunch of Africans that were different colored skin, different background, different languages. But I remember always telling those that argued that way that this Bible, as far as the culture goes, they can relate to a whole lot more than someone from a Western civilization. You know, we have to go maybe look up in a dictionary what a shepherd is or find out what a sheep is or even a sheepfold because we just don't see them around here unless you might know some sheep farmers and you know a little bit about, but even how the shepherds lived back then and how the sheepfolds were is so foreign to what our concept is. But in this particular parable, understanding the culture will help us understand a little bit more about what Christ is saying here. It's probably some help as we read this particular story, parable, concerning the sheepfold, 
to think about that in that part of the world, in Palestine, where shepherds were prevalent, still are today if you went over there. And I remember even in Africa, driving down the road and looking out, and you could see shepherds walking behind their sheep or directing them in some way. They spent their lives with these sheep that were under their observation. But think of a land that's infested with all kinds of wild beasts. But in every village, and I saw this in Africa, but this is the way it was here, there was a large sheepfold because villagers couldn't afford to necessarily build their own for all of their sheep. So each village had its own sheepfold and it was the common property of those of that village. So that when they brought their sheep in at night, the sheepfold was protected. It had a wall, sometimes 10 or 12 feet high. And that's why even here in verse one, when it said they climb up some other way, they really had to want to get in there to steal sheep. That's how the Lord was describing the false shepherds. But when night would fall, a number of the different shepherds coming in from the fields, they would lead their flocks up to the door of the sheepfold. So it was a common sheepfold. That's why I want us to see here in verse 1, this sheepfold is not heaven. <laughs> it's not salvation. Salvation is in the shepherd calling out his sheep. But this common sheepfold represents what all of these shepherds, different shepherds did in bringing their sheep in. And they'd leave them in the care of a porter. That was a hired, that was a hireling. Somebody that when the sheep came in, often this porter would lay in the doorway so that if any harm would come, that porter would be there to fight off any thieves or robbers or even wild animals that would try to get in and would lay on guard throughout the night, ready to protect the, the sheep that were in the sheepfold against any danger. And then in the morning, when different shepherds would come in, it's interesting that each shepherd had their own call for their particular sheep. I saw this demonstrated one time up in Ohio at a fair. There was a shepherd there that had his sheep and he literally brought in other sheep because it was a type of fair, so all these different people were demonstrating their sheep. So they put them all together in one place. And it was interesting, each shepherd had a call for their sheep. And when that shepherd would call, the, the ears, those sheep would perk up. And as they continued to call them, they started moving toward that shepherd. And the rest didn't pay any attention. That's an amazing thing to see. But that's exactly what this is describing that when these particular shepherds would come in the morning to claim their own, that the porter would allow each one to go in through that door and call out by name the sheep that belonged to their particular flock. And the sheep would respond to their voice. And he'd lead them out to pasture and then bring them back in. Well, that's the parable that we find our Lord giving here. The sheepfold, as I said, is not heaven here. And one big reason is that thieves and robbers can't break in and steal when it comes to heaven. Those that are in heaven are the Lord's. But I would say also it's not the church. It's where a lot of people have it wrong that somehow these all pertain to the church and uh, we're the Lord's anyway. No, it's pretty clear they're not. That this particular sheepfold, if it were the church, you wouldn't find the shepherd leading out the sheep from that church. He doesn't do that. But the sheepfold here then is clearly nothing more in this particular 
context, and this is the culture that we need to understand here, is Judaism. That word Judaism pertains to the religion of the Jews and the religious leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees. This was their sheepfold. And this is what our Lord is attacking because they, rather than being under shepherds, caring for the sheep as they should, they were gathering people after themselves, like so many preachers do today. They're not interested in, in whether any of the lords are not. All they care about is how many are attending and how many they have control over. And continuing to ride herd is what they, we say. But here, in particular, this sheepfold was manifestly that religious system of the day. But the picture that we see here is that in that sheepfold, there were indeed some of God's elect, sheep that pertained unto this shepherd for whom he came into this world. And them also, he said, I must bring. You stop and consider your own self, each of us here today. I know this is my case. I was raised in religion. I was raised in a system of religion much like what the Jews were with rules and regulations and traditions, do this, don't do this, be this, all of these things. And until it pleased God to reveal Christ in me, I didn't know any different. I didn't know any better. I followed along like a sheep to the slaughter. And had the Lord left me there, I certainly would have been slaughtered. Sold down the road to somebody else. Another form of bondage. A lot of people today are in that frame of mind. They get tired of one particular system and they go on down the road and fall into the same trap down the road. All they can find are wolves. Because the Lord has never crossed their path. But I'll tell you this, if He ever crosses your path, you're never going to go back in to that sheepfold. And that's what we see here the Lord doing. In contrast between the true shepherd and the false shepherd, between Christ and the Pharisees, that's what we see here in this parable. The door here that he speaks of not entering by the door of the sheepfold, this door cannot be confused with the door in verse 9 where Christ said, I am the door. The door here in verse 1 is not Christ. This is the door of professionism. This is the door of religion. This is the door of religiosity. And here in verse 1, it is in contrast from the climbing up some other way. It signifies then that there was a lawful way of entrance even for the shepherd. See, our Lord to rescue his sheep and to call them out, even of this Jewish religion, he did not climb up some other way. He himself came through the door. It signifies that even the Lord Jesus Christ to save one of his sheep that was found in religion and in Judaism, he fulfilled the law. He didn't just come take them out and say, I don't have to. He obeyed the law, the very law that this Judaism represented, but perverted. Christ actually came and lawfully in calling out his sheep did so in such a way as God was just to justify. That's what I see here. When it says, he that entereth in by the door, see that in verse 2, is the shepherd of the sheep. What door is he talking about? Because he is the door, so it's not talking about him entering in by the door. He's talking about entering into this door of Judaism, of Israel of old, that had the law, that had the the tabern the temple had the sacrifices, had all of these things, and yet the Pharisees were misusing 
and how they were teaching them, but here he comes, entering in through that door. In other words, when he presented himself even to Israel, he presented himself in a lawful manner, in strict accord with all of the scriptures. They accused him of setting aside the law because he would not give credence to their way of teaching the law. But he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. That's why it says here in verse 2, he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. We know that when Christ came, he submitted himself to every condition that God himself had established and answered every jot and tittle of the law as the Messiah in presenting himself to the people. He was born of a virgin, and uh, he was of Jewish stock, wasn't he? So, seed of David. Talk about a Jew, a very Jew. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, if you look over there with me, Galatians 4 and verse 4, it says that in the fullness of the time, and I want you to see that, and when the fullness of the time he came exactly at that time when God purposed. When that was come, God sent forth from His Son, made of a woman. See, that's what the law said all the way back there in Genesis 3.15, that it would be the seed of the woman. Made under the law. This was His lawful entry into this sheepfold. Through that door of Judaism. According to what the Old Testament Scriptures prophesied, the Old Covenant. But what? To redeem, not everybody, but to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Who was he after? His sheep. Those that the Father had given him. And uh, so in every way, he entered in through that door. So that's the cultural understanding of the sheepfold and the door. But thirdly, the third C, and this is what I've called commentary, What's the understanding of all this? Well, it says there in verse 3, to him the porter openeth. That word porter literally means the doorkeeper. So the only time we ever find this word elsewhere is in actually in John chapter 18. If you go over there in verses 16 and 17. And how these two references illustrate once more the law of contrast between the door here and then in, in uh, John 18, verses 16 and 17, it says there, this is with Peter, when he stood outside of the judgment hall, verse 16, Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her, notice, they kept the door. There's a doorkeeper. Even there, here was a particular woman and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of the man's disciples? He said, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The picture you want to see there, that's what a doorkeeper does. They stand at the door. But here, in contrast to Peter, where it was this damsel that kept that door, in essence, in judgment, here in John 10 and verse 3, it says to him, the porter openeth. There's a lot of commentary, and that's why I entitled this commentary, about who this doorkeeper is. But if you stop and think about it, it's not the preacher. We don't keep the door of the sheepfold. But when it says here that the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice, who is that doorkeeper that when the porter opens, the sheep hear the voice of Christ? Well, I'll tell you that. The only one that can cause any sheep to hear the voice of Christ is going to be the Spirit of God. And it's the Spirit of God 
who is the doorkeeper of this sheepfold determining who will hear and who won't. That's important for us to see. That's in fulfillment of what Christ said, for judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see. Who is it that causes the sheep to see? It's the Spirit of God. Who is it that also blinds sinners that they see not? See, this is where people get their back up. It's, it's the Spirit that's determining these things. He determines whether you'll see or not. It's the Spirit of Christ. But I'll tell you, if any of us do see, if any of us have been, have been caused to, as it says there, hear His voice, so that He calls His own sheep by name and leads them out, well, who is it that causes a sinner to hear the voice of the shepherd so that he leads them out? It's none other than the Spirit of Christ Himself. So that's what we see here. Yes, for a time, we were all in this sheepfold. Not even knowing at that time. Maybe we thought we were the Lord's already and, and we weren't. Paul describes his experience there in Galatians 1 as being having been set apart from his mother's womb but called by his grace. He was part of that sheepfold for years. The religious Judaism pursued even those that had anything to do with Christ unto death, and yet, in a moment's time, things changed. That's when the shepherd came to that sheepfold and called him out, drew him out. So that's the commentary that we see here. And then the conclusion. And really, we're going to conclude with the conclusion here and come back to this, the Lord willing, next time. Because we've seen that the door was the legitimate appointed entrance into the fold. And that meant that Christ must needs have come through that door. He didn't set aside the law. He came to fulfill it. All that that Old Testament covenant dealt with. And the porter is that one, the spirit that bears witness to Christ throughout all the scriptures. That he is this one shepherd of whom the scriptures speak. And that when he comes to call out any one of his own, this is the conclusion. He's going to have every one for whom he came. There's not going to be one left in this sheepfold of religion and blindness and works and will worship this one of the Lord. He's going to draw them out. He's going to call them out, and they will indeed hear his voice. So we'll pick up with that next time in verse 4, when he put it forth his own sheep. Notice that, in contrast to sheep that men claim as their own, when he put it forth his own sheep. Notice he goeth before them, not drive them. He's leading them, and the sheep follow him. But they know his voice. There are a bunch of people that have never heard the voice of Christ and they think, well, if you get rid of the law, if you get rid of the rules and the regulations and how you expect people to live, well, they'll, they'll live according to how the shepherd <laughs> draws them. I know that by my own experience, by his grace. The Lord willing, we'll pick up with that next time.